it was a very happy school and we enjoyed going there and we were looking forward to our half term break which was coming up on the uh, Friday afternoon uh, after we'd finished uh, the morning session of, of school. Panskalas was the local primary school and for generations every village family sent their children there. The teaching staff were good friends. It was 22 year old Hetty Taylor's first job. It was a happy school with a marvellous headmistress. She was one of the old school, um, but would always stand by you. you know, as long as you did your best for the children, then she would back you. Miss Jennings' school had 240 pupils and was built at the turn of the 19th century. By 1966, it was dwarfed by a complex of tips where the local colliery dumped its waste. The headmistress's room was in the front of the school overlooking Moy Road. Next to her was the top class of 11-year-olds taught by Greta Bates. The classrooms opposite them looked directly towards the mountains and the tips. In the front of the school were the younger children taught by Hetty Taylor and Rennie Williams. It was a horrible morning. The mist was down, it was raining, it was horrible and we were the first ones there. And then um, some of the children started coming in. We walked to school from Abervan Road, and where I lived on Abervan Road at the time. And I stopped and picked up uh, Robert Jones, who was my friend. He was the doctor's son who lived about three doors down from me. And we walked along Abervan Road and then through the old gullies. And then walking up to Panclass School, where Panclass uh, was in my road. We then went into uh, the school, took off our coats in the cloakroom and uh, went along into the classroom. And two little boys always came in in the mornings to help me put things out, you know, so I went up and saw those. Two little girls, Julie and Lynn, came to get recorders, because they played recorders in my uh, recorder band, so they wanted to practice, um, so I saw two of those. Before the lesson started, uh, I exchanged my library books because I had gone through the Janet and John series of books. So uh, I'd walked over to the, um, the window on the far side of the classroom where all the library books were kept. More than 500 feet above the village, tip number seven loomed. There had been heavy rain over the past three weeks and the 360,000 tonnes of colliery waste was saturated and unstable. While I was marking the register then, I heard a terrible noise, like, um, well, I thought it was an aeroplane coming down on top of the school. So I said to the children, get under your desk, get under your desk, because I thought it was coming from above, really. What we heard then was a thunder noise, a rolling sound. And uh, it was an old Victorian school with um, lights coming down from the ceiling on uh, long wires. And they began to shake back and forth. The noise they heard was the roar of the tip rushing down the mountain. It was 9.15. According to the gang of labourers at the top, it rolled down like an avalanche. It swept up a farm, killing two children and their grandmother. To me, it sounded like somebody dragging heavy furniture through the hall because my room was next to the hall. But it just just must have been the walls collapsing in at, at that time and all the boulders and everything being brought down inside the school. I could hear knocking on the window. And I looked up and it was the caretaker, Mr Andrews. And um, he said, can you get out? We just waited for a while. The noise stopped. So I thought, well, the only thing we can do now is get these children out. And with that, Sir Howell Williams had come across from his room with some children, and he got up on the windowsill and managed to open the window. I passed all the children out that were in the classroom to the outside. I said to the children, now you go down the steps, you go home. Don't look, just go home. Go home to your mammies and tell them something's happened in school. When I went back up the steps and looked, it was horrible. The end of the school had gone. When you looked at the school, 
You knew that nobody could have come out from that bottom end. You knew almost straight away. I mean, it was the tip that went through the school. It was black, it was slurry, and, you know, it had gone through a farm. Well, the farm and, and things had come down, so it was obvious, you know, where it had come from. The next thing I remember was waking up um, covered with all this material um, with a, a dead girl on my shoulder and uh, a little aperture of light above me um, where you could see the um, dust reflecting and no roof to the actual building. The roof had absolutely caved in and gone. Three classrooms disappeared, buried underneath 60,000 tonnes of slurry. People came from different places and they started going in. Uh, men, they wouldn't let us go in, because I said, well, let me go in, because I know where the classrooms are, you know, the, the way they are around the hall. But they stopped us then, and um, we had to go to the side then and wait while um, the miners came up then. And that was absolutely, oh, amazing, because they just walked up with the lights on from the shift before. And they came and they took over then, because obviously they knew what to do. Because they'd gone in quite quickly, they were able to get some of the children that were still alive, or, you know, they were stuck in their desks and things, but they were able to get some of those out. The fire service or rescuers came along and they had to break into the classroom through the windows that uh, overlooked the hall itself. And you, you had loads of people just coming into the classroom all above you because you were, I say, covered in this stuff. And uh, the next thing I remember, somebody's arm coming through this little hole and pulling stuff away because they saw my, my hair was, was very white, it was very blonde. And uh, effectively, that, that also uh, saved me. My stomach was trapped also under the desk and they had to use hatchets to um, get away the desk fr from me. And then uh, I was carried out by um, Tom Harding. How are the children that you have got out, the ones that were alive? Oh, well, they look, they look terrible. And that's all you can say. They look ghastly, you know. They had been given morphia with the doctor and they were just taken away. At first, there was confusion as to where the buried classrooms were. After 11 a.m., nobody was brought out alive. They were from actual mine rescue men digging a hole in to get two boys out. We got the one out, but then we had to drop in on top of the other because there was no chance. They were completely dead, you know. Then they started um, bringing bodies out, and they brought out what they said was a big boy. And they wondered if anybody had been over from the, the a comprehensive school. I thought then of Michael, because Michael was young, and um, he always wore grey trousers and a blazer, so he looked as if he was in the school uniform, you know. So I said, well, um, it could be one of the staff, it could be Michael. So they asked if I'd go, and I said yes, and it was Michael. A news flash of the disaster was broadcast at 10.30 a.m. It was the first time that many of those called there had heard of the village. Television coverage turned this into the collective witnessing of a disaster. But being there was not comfortable. When they got up to near the houses, uh, all this sludge and the black coal dust had come down through the back of the houses, through the rooms and out through the front windows and out to the road below. It was a terrible scene to see that, you know, how anybody could have survived through that. 170,000 tonnes had come down the mountain, nearly half of it smashing through two water mains before engulfing the school and 18 houses in a black quicksand. It's an incredible sight. The whole mountain is moving again. The police are here calling us away from a house which is, they think is about to come down. Suddenly the tip is on the move again and is now moving into the main village street. 
making useless the whole work already done here by excavators which have been moving backwards and forwards all morning. This was number one Moy Road in this tragedy struck village here. The house itself is on fire, it's burning underneath there, but nobody's doing anything about it just in case perhaps there's somebody alive underneath. Every now and again everybody stops working, the bulldozers stop, and everybody listens to see if they can hear anybody, hear anybody under this rubble. I must admit, standing here and looking at the wreckage, it seems almost a hopeless task. When did you come back here? Oh, I didn't reach here till about 11 o'clock. Do you think there's anybody still here? Yeah, my mother's probably in here. Mixing with all the miners digging away there, and I remember Eddie Thomas, the boxer, and he was a miner at that time, and he was digging away there with his hands, and I remember the blood and the skin had come off all the top of his fingers, and the fingers were bleeding. But well, it was awesome to see how, how they were fighting, you know, to get at the children. The rescue continued with hope through the afternoon. By five o'clock, 20 bodies had been recovered, Another 150 were believed missing. Well, I know where my son is at the moment. He's buried in uh, that end classroom up there. Good. And what about your other child? Well, uh, she's all right, she is. Little girl is all right. Did she come out this morning? She came out, um, yes, yeah, they both came to school this morning about 10 to 9. And uh, he went a little bit earlier than she did. But, uh, uh, well, she's all right, but... Uh, that looks a drug for him, and yeah. When something dreadful happens, you hope that it's not going to be so bad as you you feel it might be. I remember sitting in the classroom with the doctor's wife. She lost her eldest child as well. Robert was in Sharon's class. So all the children in that class died with their teacher, Mr. Bynan. And she said to me, we know how this is going to end, don't we? She was already trying to acclimatise herself to the idea that Robert was dead. And I wasn't ready to believe that. I was ready only to do what I could and not think any further. Have you got anybody in the school? Yes, a little boy. And how old is he? Ten. Do you know what's happened to him? No, I'm afraid he's underneath the... Terrible. What time did he go to school this morning? Oh, nine o'clock. And what time did you hear about this? Did you see it? The little girl came home about um, 20 past nine to half past nine. Has anybody been able to tell you anything about what's happened to your child? No, nothing at all. Nothing. How long are you going to wait here now? Oh, for, until I see what has happened to him. Everybody now is calling for quiet, and we'll see if anything can be heard. During the day, they'd shout for quiet. What some of the miners wondered was whether there might be pockets, and there might be children in there that, you know, were still alive. Um, but after a certain time, they weren't bringing out any children that were alive. All of the classrooms, Greta Bates' classroom and Di Bynan's classroom. Nobody came out of those classrooms. In Michael's class, they were sort of asphyxiated, really, because Michael didn't have any um, dirt on him at all. So I think in that class, that was the biggest thing, you know. The air was just blocked out. Throughout the day, volunteers came from miles away to join the rescue operation. But much of the school was smashed to sticks and there were no registers available, nor any record of who was in the houses. Nobody had any idea of the number of children or bodies they hoped to find. All they could do was try and move the rubble by hand. Machinery would be too brutal.
As the bodies were brought out, parents watched helpless. We stood there opposite the entrance to Moy Road. The bodies were put into the old Bethania Chapel and people had to go and identify their dead. Well, I couldn't do that. I couldn't do it. We were helping with the lists and things to begin with. Then we helped identify bodies because they were bringing children out and it was better to know who they were than distressed parents by coming in and, you know, you look and find sort of thing, isn't it, you know? Evening drew on and the recovery of bodies continued. Men were still digging frantically, unaware that there was no more life to save. They just wouldn't give up. They kept on working all the time, you know, they just wouldn't stop. By 10 p.m., 60 bodies had been recovered. By 2 a.m., the toll was 83. Gwyn came down and said that they had um, found the children in Sharon's class and that they had taken them to the chapel where they were laid out and washed and laid out as best could be done on the, um, the chapel benches and seats. And the people who had children in the school were going to identify them. And Gwyn had identified Sharon. I think it was, I don't know, not the next day or the day after that they found Miss Jennings. They, they, they said they'd found uh, an older lady. I mean, she must have been in her room on her own. And I didn't find Greta for a long time. Madge, they took a while finding Madge. And we found out later that she'd been pregnant as well. So... Everybody been so happy, you know, you just couldn't believe that that had happened. Five teachers were among the dead. Those who could dug, others wrote and gave money. 88,000 letters and donations from all over the world poured into a fund which would eventually raise one and three quarter million, more than 18 million in today's money. Harold Wilson, the Prime Minister, flew to Abervan from the north of England that evening. He promised that everything would be done to find out what had caused this horrific disaster. By Saturday morning, 100 bodies had been recovered. Just over 24 hours after the tip had slid on top of its junior school, the village of Abervan was becoming a media circus. The reporters are coming down from London, the newspapers, they came down for pictures, they didn't care a damn what, they'd have their picture, they didn't care what they do, they step over people just to get a picture, but the next day they're gone, the different ones come in next day and of course there was a bit of aggro then because of these reporters. Conspicuous by his absence was the chairman of the National Coal Board, Alf Robins, who was being installed as Chancellor of Surrey University. Well, the coal board naturally has a great responsibility for all that happens as a result of its mining operations. We take the standard care about pit heaps and everything else, but always you will find something that is out of the ordinary. Local people were incredulous. They knew that the spring had existed as long as the village. Past warnings of the danger of tip slides had been clear and consistent, but unheeded by the coal board. Newspapers speculated that the coal board was to blame. Rattled by these accusations, the government ordered a clampdown on coverage of the disaster. Intentional or not, they had begun to shield the coal board. 
the Attorney General of the day uh, announced that because there was a tribunal sitting, anything which the newspapers commented about Abhavan uh, would be held to be in contempt of court. Now, it's impossible to imagine that happening now. The newspapers would ignore it if, if the Attorney General tried it and the Attorney General wouldn't try it. The coal board was dominant in South Wales and already there were fears that it was so powerful it could whitewash any investigation. In a sympathetic move, the man appointed to head the inquiry was Lord Justice Edmund Davis, who came from a neighbouring mining valley. All I know is that there will be no whitewashing at all. We shall conduct a searching inquiry, and if there be blame to be cast, it will clearly be cast. Equally, if nobody is to blame, then those who are possibly, I do not know, being blamed, will be exculpated. With all but one body recovered, six days after, the bereaved were preparing to bury their dead. I used to arrive every day and I was down by the old colliery in, in the bottom part now of Abervan. And as kids always do, now if you see somebody film me, they always come to you, oh, Mr, can I help you, Mr, can I help you? And I thought to myself, well, come with me. And I never forgot, I remember, I never had his name. And we called him Johnny. And I said, Johnny, I said, you keep stay with me all day carrying these small square tins of film and in your pocket and stuff, and then you get half a crown every day. And I thought, well, you'll have no. So ne next morning, he was there again, half a crown in his pocket. And this carried on until the funeral morning. Uh, there was a Pentecostal hall ac across the road. And there was three hearses outside, and there was uh, uh, coffins with a few children in there. And he was tugging away at my trousers, and he said, I'm going now, I'm going now. Johnny's now going. I'm going. No, I'm in, I'm going now. He said, it's my sister in there, he said to me. <gasps> that upset me, that it. I never saw him afterwards. Eighty-two of the victims were buried together on October the 27th. A generation of the village. The only adult among them was a mother who was buried with her two sons either side of her. The loss of 144 lives in a small community meant that everyone was bereaved, through family or friends. The graveyard did not seem big enough. The boundaries were pushed into fields to accommodate the young victims. Many of the bereaved were miners who worked for the colliery that created the waste on the tip. Miners were used to the dangers inherent in their work, but these were their children, the future. For the survivors, there was little professional help available. Stress from trauma was not yet a recognized disorder. They relied on local support, visits from friends and family. The day after the funeral, the parents' group held its first meeting. There was a, a bereaved mother's group that was started by two ladies who went round the bereaved mothers. Not an easy job to ask them if they would like to meet one evening a week to talk things over and to help one another if we could. And personally I thought it was not 
a healthy thing to do. But I couldn't have been more wrong. Because that group, I think, was the saving of some of the mothers. And I include myself in that because it was through going there together we could let our hair down. We didn't have to be mother, wife, neighbour. We could just be ourselves. And if we had pain, we all understood. If we wanted to cry, everybody else wanted to understood. If we wanted to laugh, people understood that too. If we wanted to show pictures of our kids, that was fine. Things that we had to think twice about outside that group, we could do in the group. The Aberfan Parents and Residents Group became the public voice of the village. The group enabled the bereaved to vent their feelings. These minutes show how often they would meet and how they planned to get justice. They hired the best legal team they could. I think I've only done two brave things in my life, and one of them was to walk up steps of the Zion Chapel and address some 200 parents from the pulpit. And I've never encountered such a glacial audience. Uh, the initial reaction to me was, who's this chap they brought down from London to whitewash the coal board? The tribunal opened in November and provided reassurance to the parents that the truth would be told. They had confidence in their barrister. My job, as I saw it, was to establish the blameworthiness resided right at the top uh, in the cobord itself, uh, in fact with Robins, uh, and to resist the efforts made by the NCB to try and push it down uh, to the most junior of their staff. Like most of the villages in the South Wales Valleys, Aberfan owed its existence to a colliery, Merthyr Vale, and its livelihood to the coal board. In South Wales in 1966, the board employed 60,000 people and was supposed to serve and be part of the community. Men knew how to get the coal out of the ground, but not how to manage the waste. The cheapest way to get rid of it was to put it on the mountain. Hundreds of thousands of tons of it in every valley. One of the main features of the South Wales coal field is the fact that it's the only mountainous coal field in the whole of Britain, and a rare example in Europe, indeed, of a mountainous coal field. This determined the whole shape of the townscape. You had to fit in your houses in strips along the side of the mountain. It did mean, of course, uh, that there was always the danger of a landslip. If you go to Nottinghamshire or Fife, where you see flat coal fields, these problems wouldn't have arisen there. Uh, these problems are unique to the South Wales coal field. As the coal came out of Merthyr Vale Colliery, so did the waste and the slag heaps grew. 360,000 tonnes made up tip number seven, which, as ordnance survey maps showed, was built on a spring. The waste was different from other tips. As production methods improved, the slag was finer material. They should have made sure that there were proper surveys and inquiries and should have acted accordingly, but they did know about it. People knew that there were streams on the side of the mountain, and one of those streams led into the tip itself. Well, we walked up there this afternoon, and the water is coming down the what we call the rue, and it's flooding down, and it's never been like that before. We were talking to a workman, and it's been diverted there from the tips now since this disaster. So there must be something wrong up there. There must be water there. It was the stream inside the tip which made it unstable and it was a matter of chance that it hasn't slipped down earlier. 
there was an immense weight placed upon the ground and upon unstable ground, and a slip was clearly foreseeable once you knew that there was a stream inside the heart of the tip. The coal boards denied this. They claimed the disaster had happened because of a coincidence of geological factors. People's anger turned on the tip workers. They've been called murderers, responsible for uh, what happened, which is, which is nonsense. I mean, that's all he was paid for, and like myself, was tipping for the muck. Could you get rid of it? Or better it is for you. I mean, as far as the safety of the tip is concerned, there's nothing to do with us. The presumption in the coal board was we can do no wrong. We are an immensely powerful organization and we just shrug off the attempts by our employees to try and blame us in any way. And I was irritated by this waste of time. It was staring them in the face, but they wouldn't accept it. They fought the case as if it was a one-day mining accident, accident when the co-board's usual policy was let them prove it. The fact that the coal board blocked and bluffed for 70 days plus of the inquiry and beyond is one of the scandals of Aberfan. Lord Robins was invited to give evidence at the tribunal to reply to Lord Ackner's attacks. He appeared four months into the hearing and ten days before the end. He admitted that the disaster was foreseeable. I was not aware that anybody uh, wanted any special information that I may have. I am not a technician, and I'm, I'm an administrator. He was arrogant. Uh, he seemed to resent being called uh, to give evidence, uh, and he was contradictory. And in the end, uh, the board under the stimulation of the board's advisers, I said we can pay no attention to Lord Robin's evidence. No, I didn't um, feel that I was personally on trial because I have never uh, tried to escape in my own mind from the fact that as chairman of the National Coal Board, I must personally accept uh, responsibility for all that takes place in the Coal Board. And what I'm most anxious is that no officials should be unduly, unduly penalised or singled out. The tribunal's findings published in August were damning. It was a tale of bungling ineptitude, they said, but their conclusions didn't reveal the passion behind the hearing. They were appalled by the behaviour of the coal board and some of its employees. There's a separate section of the report which is extremely critical. It's headed, The Attitude of Lord Robins, for, in effect, wasting public time and money, propagating an entirely incorrect version of what had happened. Harold Wilson, the Prime Minister, I now know, wrote on his copy, uh, we must have a, something to the effect of, this is devastating, uh, when he saw the first preprint, um, and they had a Cabinet committee to decide how to handle it. When I read the tribunal report more closely, it was really 30-year-old feelings that came back to me. How on earth did these guys get away with this? How on earth was there no criminal prosecution? Uh, how on earth did everybody involved in this disaster keep their jobs? And the further up the organisation they were, the more pressing that question was. Lord Robins, what? The government of the day, in a sentence, was terrified of Lord Robins the preceding Conservative government under Harold Macmillan, put him in charge of the National Coal Board because he was a big and bluff trade union leader. They knew, but dared not say, that the coal industry was losing money hopelessly, that it had to be slimmed down, that that was likely to provoke a national stri strike by the then very powerful National Union of Mine Workers, and they thought that trade unionist Alf Robins was the one man that could handle that. 1964, you had a change of government. Conservatives out, Labour in. 
but they have exactly the same view of the coal industry and exactly the same view of Lord Robins, that he is the one man who can fend off a miners' strike while still slimming down the coal industry. There was no justice for the parents from politicians. And now the disaster fund came under bureaucratic scrutiny. People from around the world had given money, but if they thought this money would go directly to the bereaved, they were mistaken. The Charity Commission had its own rules. Families should be means tested to assess their grief. They sent an official to Abavan to say that uh, the trustees must not make flat rate payments to all bereaved families. Uh, they must inquire into the circumstances of each family in turn and not make payments unless they had satisfied themselves that the bereaved parents had been close to their deceased children. So I found that pretty shocking and so do most people that I tell the story to. The coal board was slow to acknowledge its liabilities. For months, those who lost their homes had lived in caravans. A year later, the wreckage of Pantglas School and the houses was not cleared. But worse, the tips still towered over the village despite the best efforts of the village's tip removal committee and the local Labour MP, S.O. Davis. Lord Robins went to meet the wives group. Well, we've invited uh, Lord Robins uh, down today in the hope that we can make our feelings known to him and that he will um, consider the complete removal of them because we don't feel that we will be happy in Aberfan again. Well, it's a constant reminder of the way my child died and the tons of earth that fell on her, there's tons more there waiting to come down on other children. Well, it isn't for the coal board to make that decision. That's a governmental decision. Uh, the only decision we could make would be on the making safe of the tip complex, which we have done and are finishing off. And then uh, the landscaping and making it more attractive by forestation and grass planting and tree planting and so on. But if a decision is made to remove the whole of the tip complex, which certainly the women in the village would like to see, that's a matter for the government. This was typical of the cobalt. This was the arrogance. We can do no wrong. But they not only didn't say they were sorry, they didn't clear the tips away at their expense. It was a terrific fight. I remember us going down to the Welsh office and waiting for the results of our um, request to have the tips removed. But it was not granted. So we just picked up our um, bags and our kids and just walked in. We wanted to see George Thomas and we saw George Thomas. Well, last week I met a deputation from the village. They spoke so movingly to me of the emotional strain the villagers are suffering that although we are perfectly satisfied that there is no physical threat to the village I felt that I had to tell the government there were other considerations so we asked him to take a message to the government to tell him that if they didn't remove the tips we would we would bag it bit by bit and send it around to every member of the government and every person who uh, we thought was unable to grasp that the removal of the tips meant uh, survival of our community. If in public George Thomas supported and sympathised with the people of Abervan, in private he was less unequivocal. The record shows that he thought their fears irrational, but was concerned with the public image of the government. The government had promised to do all that it could, but cost was always an issue, and the people of Abervan were about to find this out. The disaster fund was asked to pay £250,000, a third of the cost of removing the tips. You were angry. 
but we were going through such awful grief that we weren't really able to fight our corner, you know. So we had to accept that some things we couldn't, we couldn't fight off. George Thomas managed to reduce the contribution to £150,000, but still the needs of the people of Aberfan were second to the political needs of the day. If the cost of removing colliery tips was charged to the pits, then all the pits would be shown to be losing money, and that would have led to a much more rapid rundown of the coal industry than actually happened. All governments wanted to avoid this because they wanted to avoid a national miners' strike. This is not a personal reflection on George Thomas, it's a structural fact that the Secretary of State for Wales is right at the bottom of the hierarchy of the Cabinet. It's the most junior government department in the 1960s, it had only just been created. The Ministry of Power, well, power was, you know, what the national government was about, and so the Ministry of Power, irrespective of the holders of these posts, the Ministry of, Minister of Power was a much more powerful department, and where the interests of power and Wales conflicted, it was power that got its way. Ron Davis, a young Labour supporter, was incredulous. There was no answer to it. I mean, we, we knew what was happening. Um, we knew that a, that a Labour government was, was taking money from a disaster fund to do work which should have been done anyway. Um, and how can, you, you know, how can you comprehend that people in, in far-off countries, many of them living in poverty themselves, had, had literally sent pennies to a disaster fund, and here was a Labour government, I can only use the word stealing uh, that money, which was donated for a, for a very worthy, very charitable purpose, stealing that money. Uh, to discharge its own obligations to clean up the, uh, the filth of the coal industry. I mean, it, it was just incomprehensible. In 1997, Labour were returned to power after 18 years. Ron Davis became Secretary of State for Wales and gave the money back to the people of Aberfan. Very high amongst my priorities was um, the desire to, to right that particular injustice because I knew it was something that I could do. It didn't have to be crunched in legislation through, uh, through Westminster, it didn't have to go through cabinet committees. It was a question of me saying, let's make the arrangements and let's get this money back as quickly as possible. And that's what happened. aftermath of the disaster include the Ynys Owen Male Voice Choir and the Aberfan Wives Group, who are still going strong today. The fund provided a new community centre with a Swiss swimming pool and after another bureaucratic battle, maintenance for the memorial which brought some consolation to ageing parents. A new school was built in the village. Though by 1970, the coal board still had not repaid the cost to Merthyr Council. For all its promises, the government failed the people of Aberfan. We also had a line of inquiry about uh, the degree of compensation which should be given to families who lost their children. The National Coal Board's initial offer was £50 per family. After an uproar, uh, they raised this offer to £500, and that's where they stuck, and they wouldn't be budged. And in the papers, I found an insurance officer of the coal board describing the £500 as, quote, a generous offer, unquote. And the coal board wouldn't be moved from that sum of money. By the time that I'd started going into the papers again, 1996, 97, 98, my view that the people of Aberfan had been treated very badly, not only before and during, but also after... The disaster was confirmed and that was when I first started um, meeting and talking to people in Aberfan and to start to get to know them which I must say I find quite a humbling experience. It's a very different world back there in the 1960s. The past is another country as they say, they do things differently there. I think it's as relevant now as it was then, it's relevant in Aberfan and Merthyr, surrounding areas, and it's relevant in the whole country. Nationally, 
there's been a revolutionary change in our attitude to corporations which are so slipshod that they cause disasters. And that revolutionary change of attitude is, I think, partly due to Abafan. Governments never stand or fall by what happens in South Yorkshire or what happens in South Wales or what happens in the Fife coalfield. Even though these are, these are areas, all of them, which were very safe for the Labour Party and therefore hopeless for the Conservative Party, you know, that doesn't help. A Labour government can ignore its politically safe areas. A Conservative government has got no reason to reach out to its politically hopeless areas. So had Aberfan happened in any of the other mining areas, nothing very different would have happened. I think the culpability of the coal board over Aberfan was greater than that of the ferry company in the case of the Herald of Free Enterprise that sank, where a prosecution was started but abandoned, and much, much worse than the culpability of the rail companies in any of the recent rail disasters where these things have been considered, the one at Paddington, the one at Hatfield. By comparison with the quite appalling catalogue of what the coal board did before Aberfan, they were quite minor. On the record, it's a completely open and shut case. I think the coal board should have been charged with corporate manslaughter.